At 11am on the 11th of November 1918, the guns of the Western Front fell silent. For four years, war had ravaged Europe and had resulted in almost 22 million deaths. Today on the History Chronicles on Armistice Day, we will investigate the reasons behind the armistice being signed that led to the end of the First World War. The First World War, or simply called the Great War by the British at the time, went on for four long years between 1914 and 1918. It had been triggered by a clumsy political assassination in a small province of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Soon, however, it had escalated into the first global conflict as the mighty industrial forces of Europe declared war on each other. On one side was the Triple Entente of Britain, France and Russia. On the other, the Triple Alliance of Germany, Italy and Austria-Hungary. Only months into the war, it had become clear that the devastating weapons of the Industrial Age were going to make this war a conflict unlike any other seen before. The offensive called the Schlieffen Plan, that German military leaders had envisaged would quickly knock France out of the war, had led instead to a retreat and a stalemate on two fronts. In the west, this was against the forces of France and Britain. To the east of Germany, this was against the massive armies of Russia. On the ground, the war became bogged down in muddy, bloody trenches that soldiers on all sides dug to protect themselves against machine gun fire and artillery bombardment. The war also raged quickly outside of Europe. In sub-Saharan Africa, there was fighting as German forces in East Africa raided the British colony of Kenya. The Middle East saw conflict as the British sought to break the Ottoman Empire, which entered the war on Germany's side in October 1914. On the 7th of May 1915, a German U-boat sank the UK-registered passenger liner, the Lusitania. On board, over 1,000 people were killed in the shipwreck. Among them were 128 Americans. The USA had given financial support to Britain and France in the war so far, but the sinking of the passenger liner Lusitania in the Atlantic changed things. Following a series of negotiations, the German use of unrestricted submarine warfare led to the US President Woodrow Wilson declaring war on Germany. For the leaders of Britain and France, such a declaration from America was a long time in coming. Russia, their ally, had been knocked out of the war in 1917 with the advent of a communist revolution. A separate peace was signed between Russia's new communist government and Germany at Brest-Litovsk in 1917. With Germany's forces still intact in Europe, and with no more Eastern Front tying up their manpower, the German command could now redeploy these soldiers in the West against their enemies Britain and France. However, now that the wealthy and unreachable USA had pledged to send soldiers to Europe, it was only a matter of time before Germany would be put under pressure that would, it was hoped, bring an end to the war. But German High Command had one last trick up their sleeve. If the stalemate on the Western Front could be broken before US troops reached France, then Germany might well win the war after all. In the face of a huge outbreak of Spanish flu, the German army organised the transportation of thousands of troops from the Eastern Front to the West. General Ludendorff, one of the heads of the German army, was eager to focus his forces at one particular point, putting the utmost pressure on the British and the French in one location in the hope of a breakthrough. General Pétain, on the French side, ordered for his lines to be strengthened by more British troops that were duly sent across the channel by the British General Haig. Ludendorff's attack began on the 21st of March 1918. It started with a massive artillery bombardment of the British and French lines between Arras and Saint Quentin. Behind the barrage of artillery advanced the German army, fortunately covered by a thick layer of fog that had fallen on the German troops that morning. The attack took the British by surprise and one of the German army groups, the 18th, did indeed manage to break through. However, the majority of the German attack had, as in previous battles of this bloody war, been held up under concentrated artillery and machine gun fire. Alone, the 18th could achieve very little, despite the large territorial gains that they had made in their breakthrough. Unable to support this part of the army that had made it through the lines, Ludendorff ordered a retreat. The Germans were now on the back foot, but this battle had cost the British 300,000 casualties. US forces now arrived to reinforce the British and French lines. Again in May 1918, Ludendorff pushed forward yet another German offensive. This time it was to hit the area of the Marne to the north. Once more, Ludendorff's initial attack met with success with a German breakthrough. 
but once again the German general was unable to capitalise on these gains. His reserves had been used up, and none of his forces had pressed far enough behind enemy lines to seriously disrupt supply lines or routes that could be used for reinforcements. In the meantime, the clock was ticking. US forces were now arriving in France at the rate of 300,000 men per month. One last attack, named the Second Battle of the Marne, came on the 15th of July 1918. This time, the Germans were rebuffed by a combination of General Patan's concept of elastic defence, that is, retreating very quickly and then counter-attacking, taking the enemy by surprise, and a new weapon, the tank. Following another German retreat, it was the Allies, Britain, France and the USA, that were now on the offensive. A large surprise attack against the German army was mounted near the River Somme on the 8th of August 1918. This General Ludendorff styled as the Black Day for the German army. It resulted in a German rout, with thousands of Germans being captured by their attackers. For General Ludendorff, it was clear now that the war needed to end. Back at home in Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II had ruled as Germany's militaristic monarch since 1888. He had sought to expand Germany's military strength to rival the massive armies of Russia, its close neighbour, and even the naval power of Great Britain. Before 1914, Germany had indeed been an industrial powerhouse, seeking colonies abroad and developing one of the most sophisticated military machines in Europe. By 1918, however, the war in Europe had had its toll. A naval blockade enforced by Britain since 1914 had been disastrous for the German economy. A large number of Germans now lived in poverty and faced massive unemployment. A telegram was sent by the German democratically elected government to Woodrow Wilson, the President of the USA, hoping for lenient terms of peace. However, America replied stating that the Allies' conditions would be complete German surrender. Also, the Kaiser had to go. Although General Ludendorff balked at such a statement, demanding a resumption of war, many Germans now too wanted a change from the militaristic and imperialist Germany of the past. It is worth adding here that Germany's militarism and imperialism had been blamed as a cause for the war too. Some even looked with pleasure at the redistribution of wealth that was taking place in communist Russia. General Ludendorff had found himself dismissed after his failures in 1918. He was replaced by General Kroner, who was more affable to the peace terms offered by the USA. Throughout October 1918, negotiations continued. The main sticking point, however, was to be how Germany was to be treated after the war. The US President Woodrow Wilson advocated his 14 points, which included treating the defeated Germany with a level of fairness and forgiveness and aimed to rebuild the warring nation. For the British, and particularly for the French, such a position was untenable. Germany would be blamed for the war, and must be punished harshly for the immense damage that it had caused in Europe. These issues were to remain in the years following the Great War, and were indeed to shape the peace negotiations that followed in the Treaty of Versailles of 1919. Back in October 1918, though, events were to take yet another turn for the worse for Germany. Following a mutiny in the shipyards of Kiel on the 3rd of November 1918, both the civilian and military leaders of Germany now demanded the Kaiser's abdication. For the Kaiser, the time was up. He abdicated on the 10th of November 1918, taking a train to the neutral country of the Netherlands. He was to remain in exile for the rest of his life, but was strangely to go unpunished for his role in the war. With continued rioting and chaos in Germany's capital, Berlin, a new government was formed in the city of Weimar. This was the German Revolution, but it was not a happy one. The socialist leaders of this new Weimar Republic were to be the ones who would now take the blame in Germany for the devastating consequences of the war. Back at the front, on a cold and icy morning on the 8th of November 1918, five German cars drove into northern France. In them was Matthias Erzberger, the head of the German delegation seeking peace with the Allies. They were met by French soldiers and taken to the private train carriage of General Ferdinand Foch. Here they were given the list of Allied demands. They had 72 hours to agree. These terms called for a complete demilitarisation, the abdication of the Kaiser and the complete surrender of Germany. The naval blockade of Germany's ports was to remain in place until the Germans agreed to these terms. Two days later, with the Kaiser's abdication printed on the front of that day's newspaper and shown to the Germans, the armistice was agreed. It was to take effect at 11am on the following day, the 11th of November 1918. 
The following morning on the Western Front, guns that had blasted for four straight years fell silent. The war to end all wars was finally over. The first Armistice Day was celebrated only one year later at Buckingham Palace in 1919. From its inception, this event included a two-minute silence to remember those who had fallen in this great war. In 1919, the Cenotaph was erected in London to remember Britain's war dead. If you look at pictures from Armistice Days of the 1920s and 30s, you can still see the abundance of those dressed in black, the colour worn at funerals. This is most likely because they had personally lost a loved one in the great conflict of World War I. Today, this date in Britain and in many countries across Europe and the Commonwealth is used to remember all those who have fallen in conflict. But, in remembrance events across the country, the words of an English poet writing about the First World War still ring out. They shall not grow old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. <laughs>